It's 1996, and ambitious black professionals are flocking to the city of Atlanta, helping to transform the ATL into a prosperous and glamorous destination. And one of those driven and successful professionals who've made Atlanta his own is IT entrepreneur Lance Herndon. Lance has a luxurious mansion, an expensive car, and a taste for the ladies. Lots and lots of ladies. And when Lance meets Dion Baugh, she seems like just another in a long line of conquests who Lance will love and leave. But Dion is not going away so quietly. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I am your host, Bianca Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on the case I'm calling A Time for Murder. Lance Harrison Herndon was born on April the 4th, 1955 in Harlem, the only child of Russell Harrison Herndon and Jacqueline Jackie Lonesome Herndon. The marriage between Lance's parents was doomed from the start, with Russell more interested in bar hopping with his buddies across the watering holes of Brooklyn than in playing family man to his wife and son. According to the book Redbone, The Millionaire and the Gold Digger by Ron Stodgehill, with Russell spending the, the majority of his time hanging with the $100 Club, as he and his buddies called themselves, and Mom Jackie working at J.C. Penney's or playing bridge with her friends, Lance was a lonely kid who was, quote, raised by babysitters and strict handwritten notes from Jackie about how his time was to be spent. This somewhat impersonal method of communication would pave the way for Lance's leadership style later in life, in which he avoided verbal communication with his staff, finding it to be a waste of time, instead relying on voice memos to disseminate work to his employees, telling them, quote, I was pretty much raised by notes. By the age of seven, the ongoing tensions between his parents resulted in Lance being sent to live with his paternal grandparents in the small rural town of Farmville, Virginia. This was about an hour west of Richmond, and little Lance worked the farm, tending to the chickens and cows, and picking tobacco. When he was 13, Lance returned to New York, and his affinity for math and science won him an acceptance into the Fast Track Electronic Study Program at Westinghouse High School in Brooklyn. He would eventually earn his bachelor's degree in computer science from the City University of New York. After graduating, Lance once again headed south, this time to the booming metropolis of Atlanta, which was emerging as a burgeoning mecca for young Black professionals looking to make their mark. And Lance would indeed make his mark on Atlanta when he started Access Inc., a computer consulting firm that would eventually count such powerhouse entities as the city of Atlanta, Coca-Cola, and Nations Bank as clients, and be named by Inc. Magazine as one of America's top 500 enterprises. Atlanta Mayor Bill Campbell would even choose Lance as one of the city's prominent business leaders to accompany him on a trade mission to South Africa in 1995. And in 1990, 1988, he received a National Service Award from then-President George Bush during a ceremony at the White House. And former President Bill Clinton appointed Lance to the White House Conference on Small Business in 1995. Now, Lance was not all work because he made quite a bit of time for play. He got married twice while in his 20s, first to a Puerto Rican woman, and later to a New Orleans woman who was 10 years his junior. He would meet his third wife, corporate flight attendant Janine Price, while vacationing in Brazil. While their 1990 marriage started off as a dream, with the couple building a palatial mansion in the lush, leafy, and exclusive suburb of Roswell, Georgia, Lance's workaholic tendencies, which saw him rising at 4 a.m. to start his work day, his distance and inaccessibility made her feel ignored, unloved, and unwanted. After giving birth to their son, Harrison, Janine said, peace out, took the baby, and filed for divorce. It didn't take Lance long to land on his feet, though. In fact, Lance lands on his feet over and over again. Because as Ron Stodgehill noted in The Real Murders of Atlanta, quote, Lance had a reputation for being a kind of a serial philanderer. Lance's penchant for spreading himself around Atlanta was another contributing factor in the demise of his marriage to Janine. Lance has a lot of girlfriends. A lot. According to the book Redbone, for example, Lance keeps a list of about three dozen, so that's 36, 
women in his wallet, a roster, if you will, who he can and does routinely call up one by one on Friday afternoons, inviting these women to a local bar called Atlanta Nights to join him for Friday night happy hour. And the invitees were all too happy to oblige. There was a steady stream of women, all too happy to add their apps and cocktails to Lance's tab, with the ultimate reward coming at the end of the night when one or two of them, at least, would follow Lance home to Roswell for, well, you can use your imagination. I don't need to paint that picture for you. And one of the ladies who Le- who Lance keeps front and center in the lineup is 28-year-old Dion Baugh. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution described Jamaican immigrant Dion as, quote, petite, polished, and mildly accented. She was working as an executive secretary for MARTA, which is the public transit agency in Atlanta, while getting a finance degree at Georgia State University. She also owned a house in Norcross, which was considered one of Atlanta's most desirable areas. Dion and Lance met at the lavish 41st birthday party he threw for himself in April, one that she managed to score an invitation to. According to what Ron Stodgehill told the Real Murders of Atlanta about that meeting between Lance and Dion, quote, when he met her, Lance was smitten and they started dating and it quickly turned sexual. Ron went on to say that, quote, Lance loved to wine and dine and he didn't spare any expense on Dion. Lance's generosity extends to buying Dion a Mercedes, taking her on luxury trips and gifting her with jewelry, clothes, and even giving her access to his credit cards. That is, that is something. Um, This makes Lance and Dion a perfect match. Because as the Atlanta Journal-Constitution noted, quote, Dion had a taste for the finer things in life. Now, what Lance doesn't know is that the woman he's showing the high life to is a married woman. So now Dion was actually married to a man by the name of Sean Nelson. Um, And Sean lived in Jamaica and he was an airline pilot. And, And basically Dion is playing him and Lance for fools, though her husband does eventually catch on and put two and two together and realizes what his wife is up to. Now, Dion's husband is not the only one having revelations because in the summer of 1996, July 10th to be exact, Dion stops by Lance's house uninvited. This always ends well. Uh, She goes by this one night and through the window, she sees another one of Lance's ladies walking around in a towel. This sets Dion off. She's ringing the doorbell. She's screaming. She's pounding on the door, kicking the door, just full on cuckoo clock. Lance does not let her in, but instead calls 911 and tells cops he wants a restraining order against her. Dion is not having it and gets into a physical altercation with police, so now she's kicking and fighting them, cursing them out, and is arrested for her trouble, as she should have been. And if she was expecting Lance to bail her out, well, guess again, because he lets her sit in jail. Unbelievably. Lance and Dion continue to see each other after that, But then Lance was like, you know what, there's other fish in the sea who are a lot less trouble. And he decided it was time to make a clean break. Sort of. Because Dion was still driving the Mercedes and Lance was still giving her money. So mixed signals? Much? August the 8th, 1996. Lance, whose business was located in the lower level of his house, has not shown up for work that morning and his employees are concerned. This is highly out of character for Lance, as his staff is used to showing up to work to find detailed voice memos outlining their projects for the day. On this day, there's nothing. And coupled with Lance being MIA, they're concerned. Throughout the morning, they try calling him, but keep getting no answer. So they reach out to his mom, Jackie, who lives nearby. She heads to the house and lets herself in, going upstairs to her son's bedroom which is where she finds him, dead. Lance Herndon was 41 years old. Jackie calls 911, and the scene is a bloody one, as well as a confusing one. Lance liked to sleep in the nude, and this day was no different. He was found partially covered in a sheet on the waterbed in his master bedroom. He was lying on his back, his arms folded across his chest, It was determined that Lance was murdered in his sleep and that his assailant had climbed on top of him and bashed his skull in with so many blows, with so much force, 
blood dripped down the walls. There were no defensive wounds on his arms or hands and very little blood below the waist. There was no forced entry and whoever had killed Lance took a shower before they left. Some of the more confounding details of the scene, Lance's wallet and credit cards were on the dresser, intact. The shirt and pants he had on the night before, gone. A bloody pillowcase was found stuffed in the toilet of the master bathroom, which I'm not sure how the murderer thought they could flush a pillowcase down the toilet, but what do I know? And perhaps the biggest head scratcher was the clocks. Lance was legendarily known to use three alarm clocks to wake up in the morning by 4.30 at the latest, each timed to go off at a different interval. Well, that morning, all of the clocks are unplugged, with one having stopped at 4.10 a.m. Other bizarre clues were a trail of silver gum wrappers found near the garage, the framed picture of a woman on the nightstand that's been turned face down, and Lance's very expensive laptop is missing. So this is 1996. Laptops are not a dime a dozen. A laptop is like a super, super precious commodity back then. So this is a little strange uh, that it's gone. The woman in the picture, the one that's face down on the nightstand, is determined to be Kathy Collins, one of Lance's girlfriends, his favorite, I guess, since she rated a bedside photo. Uh, she is also the woman that Dion saw walking around in a towel just a month prior. Speaking of Dion, curiously, the day that Lance's body was discovered, which is August 8th, she was scheduled to appear in court on the criminal trespass charge from July, and apparently Lance had had yet another change of heart and told Dion that he would go to court with her to have the charges dismissed. But then he turns up dead. Curious. Now, Kathy Collins provides a rock-solid alibi, so she was cleared right away, as was Lance's ex-wife, Janine. Following a tip from one of Lance's employees, cops tried to interview Dion in the immediate hours after Lance's body was found, but Dion was ducking and dodging and hiding out while the cops kept pounding on her door. That same day, again, that's the uh, day that Lance's body was found, Dion I guess to console herself, I don't know. Uh, she takes herself on a shopping spree, buying $3,000 worth of furniture using one of Lance's credit cards. So remember, that is the same day that she is supposed to be in court, and again, the same day that Lance's body was found. Um, authorities eventually do formally interview Dion on August 17th, and she says that her husband and daughter had been visiting from Jamaica and that she had driven them to the airport on August 7th the night before the murder, and then she came home. She also says that Lance came to her house later that night, sometime between 9 and 10.30, and he has this super expensive IBM laptop for her to borrow for her schoolwork. It's weird, frankly, that he would let her borrow a laptop instead of just buying her one, because he's proven that he has no problem spending money on her, lots of money. You know, he bought her a car, used my credit cards, you know, go crazy. And this is just, it's dumb. It just sounds dumb. Um, Dion says that once Lance delivered the laptop to her, he left. And that was the last time that she saw him. She also tells police that she and Lance were madly in love, on great terms. But there was that little matter of the court case that proved otherwise, which again, she said that he was going to drop charges against her, which I don't believe that. Um, again, just this sounds dumb, stupid. Cops are pretty sure that Dion is their girl, so they've come to the same conclusion I have. This doesn't make any sense. Um, but they just don't have the evidence to arrest her. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but nothing concrete. Dion really doesn't have a good alibi. There's no murder weapon, no fingerprints, no witnesses. Remember, this is 1996, and DNA is still in its infancy, and digital footprints are pretty much non-existent. You know, there's no doorbell cameras, there's no cell phone towers to track locations, none of that. So police are stuck, and they stay stuck because Lance's murder goes unsolved for two years. However, in 1998, the tides turn and cops get a wholly unexpected tip from the unlikeliest of sources. So by this time, Sean, Dion's husband, he's had enough, and the couple is getting a divorce. 
And during the course of an argument they were having, Sean asked his soon-to-be ex-wife if she had anything to do with Lance's murder. Now, Dion went off the ranch and threatens her husband. And as Clint Rucker, who used to be the um, district attorney for Fulton County, Georgia, says in The Real Murders of Atlanta, quote, she will kill Sean just like she did Lance. Well, that was practically as good as a confession, but cops don't move in just yet because Dion's divorce hearing provides the nails they need for her coffin. So when the cops had first interviewed Dion in 1996, she had painted this picture that she and Lance were madly in love and banging the gong all the time. However, in her divorce hearing, she said that she and Lance were just friends. Well, obviously the truth is somewhere in between, but it, it really doesn't matter because now Dion is on the record as a big fat liar. Dion is arrested and charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, two counts of theft, I think this was for the laptop, financial transaction, card fraud, I think that's for buying three grand worth of furniture on a dead man's credit card after you bashed his skull in. Police never do find the murder weapon, though it is determined to be a wrench from Lance's garage. And those silver gum wrappers at the scene? Turns out Dion is a compulsive gum chewer. And when they search her purse, cops find it is filled with silver gum wrappers. It's a lot of charges. And if Dion is convicted on either of the murder charges, she's getting life in prison, no chance of parole. Dion's trial starts in April of 2001, and at the conclusion of that two-week trial, she is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Oh, but wait, wait just a minute, because Dion is not through yet. In July of 2003, she gets her conviction overturned on a technicality related to the testimony of one of the detectives from her trial. This means starting all over again with a second trial. That time, the jury deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. Dion's third trial, yes, third trial, is scheduled to start in September of 2004. And by this point, everyone is just done with all of this. They have all bought all of the t-shirts and they're through. So Dion's defense team decides to strike a deal with prosecutors, basically saying if she pleads guilty to manslaughter, which is a lesser charge than murder, can we take life in jail off the table and reduce her sentence? Prosecutors agree and Dion is sentenced to 10 years in prison. She is released from jail in July of 2011. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Dark Side of Love. I am your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for The Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes, and you can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about The Dark Side of Love by visiting biancasloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side.